Good afternoon, all, and thank you for attending our Essentials of Investor Relations webinar. My name is Leila Al Saraf. I'm from the Saudi Stock Exchange Listing Division. We're extremely excited to see you all with us here today attending this webinar, which highlights just how important IR has become in the market capital. The exchange has been admin and further developing and improving the IR function among its listed companies. And through a series of workshops with our issuers, we aim and intend to cover and highlight the many facets of IR. As we will cover today, IR has many important roles to play within any organization, and it is responsible for providing information that gives a clear and accurate representation of any company. Today, we will cover the many essentials of IR with our colleagues, Debbie Nathan, Managing Director from DNA, and from the recent Best IR Program Award winner at Rajhi Bank, we have Ayana Shraibi, Head of Investor Relations. And now I would like to hand it over to our colleague from Mira, John Golliver. John, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lila. And it's always a pleasure to work with Tadawal. I think our audience knows that Saudi Arabia is not only the largest capital market in the region, but it's also the largest Mira chapter with a very, very active membership, but it's also the, the fastest growing. So we're in the right place. Uh, Leila just mentioned essentials of IR, and I can't think of anything more relevant after a very, very difficult year to essentially stop, think, and talk about what's really important. And what I've challenged today's esteemed panel of speakers to do is just try to draw out and distill what might be useful to you in the audience in terms of your own IR programs. As always, these workshops are interactive, so you do have a Q&A facility. We'll generally go through our own paces with the speakers first. Alicia, who helped Leila organize this workshop, will keep an eye on the questions. And of course, we'll be making sure that we, we find time to address those questions. If I can turn to our speakers, I'll start with congratulations to Ryan al Shuevi, who, as Leila just mentioned, is part of the inaugural Saudi Capital Markets Award-winning team and is indeed the head of IR at al Raji Bank. So huge congratulations, because as everybody knows in Mira, I take awards really, really seriously. I think it isn't just about the winners, but um, congratulations are always due to winners because I think it's amazing to win, as we all do. But I think more importantly, as we all know, it's about the process of learning. It's, as we said for this topic today, about distilling best practice and making sure that we all get better. Interestingly enough, when I was looking at Ryan's CV, he comes from a treasury background. And we all know in IR that you can't talk about equity without talking about debt. And I think to couple a treasury background, which clearly brings tremendous financial nous as a foundation to any investor relations program is very, very important. And I'm sure I'll be able to draw on some of that looking at what Ryan last did, which was to be the senior investment dealer with responsibility for money markets and investment at Al Raji Bank. And of course, banks are integral to any economic development, any economy. So the Al Rajis, and I'm sure all of you in the banking sector, indeed the financial services sector, will appreciate that. But before we get to Ryan and that award-winning IR program 2020, which I'm sure has caused the enormous draw for today's workshop, given the registrations that Leila and Alethea were telling us about earlier, let me introduce someone who's actually quite familiar to Mira in that Debbie Nathan has worked with us for a number of years on a very important practitioner survey. And it's timely because, of course, after a year of ups and downs, it's good, as I said, to, to take a step back and think about what we're doing. So I'll mention that IR practitioner survey for the Middle East um, at the end of this workshop. Interestingly enough, Debbie has all the ingredients of a, a very, very successful IR practitioner. She was actually a chartered accountant, and I was saying to her, I'm always impressed with people that, that come to the market with that qualification. She then went on to be an analyst before being an IR officer herself. And then she took a different tack, and she's now responsible for 
DNA, an international recruitment and search firm which specializes in communications, not least investor communications or IR as we call it. And I thought, given that she's sitting in London today, we would just start by taking a step back as I keep reminding us, given what we've all been through, and just ask Debbie to put into context from an international IR point of view, given her background, given her role today, what she's seeing, and to start to help us distill the key ingredients to essentials of IR. Debbie, a warm welcome. Always uh, lovely to see you and work with you, as I mentioned. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, John um, and Salela, uh, and welcome to everyone else. Um, lovely to, to, to meet you. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, very happy to talk through some of the best practice findings. The way I've kind of tackled this is actually looking at what changes we've seen over the last year um, and, and what we can take away from that going into 2021. And I think um, well, the first thing I'd say is obviously in the midst of a pandemic, um, IR teams have actually been working with an expanded stakeholder base um, and engaging with more of a global set of investors. I'm sure most of you can resonate with that. Um, investors have demanded more. Um, they want the reassurance. So, you know, without a shadow of a doubt, COVID's put pressure on boards to respond. And as, as a consequence of that, what I would say is actually it's helped IR rise up the value change, uh, chain. I recently did a, a global interview series. Some of you may have seen, it's actually on my website. And we looked at IR um, in different countries. But one of the um, resounding challenges uh, that affected many people um, was IR being recognized um, by boards and where it should be. But I, my view on this is actually COVID's helped. ESG is another factor which we'll talk about later, but again, is helping to help rise, uh, raise the profile of IR, if you like, with boards and management teams. Um, and, and I think the worst thing you can do, um, you know, through a pandemic or crisis is not communicate. Um, the other factor is obviously other companies are communicating. So peers of yours um, in the same sector or, or outside of the sector. And again, if investors are used to hearing from them, it puts more pressure on you to follow suit. Um, the types of investors also um, that you're engaging with have increased. So not only the breadth, but the type. So ESG investors, retail investors. Um, and I think this is really key for someone in uh, to bear in mind with their IR planning um, as we go into this year as well, um, how to factor in this broader uh, uh, stakeholder base into your plans. Um, obviously, uh, building trust with these, these investors is paramount. Um, and I'll talk about that again later on, but it's quite tough in a virtual capacity. Um, it's a completely different ball game when you walk into a room um, and uh, you can build that physical uh, relationship and rapport and you don't have that on a virtual um, platform. So you have to find other ways um, and other measures of, of building that trust, but it is paramount to, to get that. Um, I think the, the, the move moving on, on, on that point, the move to virtual roadshows as well and um, the digital also gives businesses access to to a range of investors if you think about it and i know from my time when i was in ir when we uh, were organizing our roadshows for the year and our ir calendar we had to really justify um a particular city that we were going to it had to warrant uh, the time spent getting there by having three four five meetings a day um otherwise it just wasn't feasible to fly halfway across america or asia or and that that's been abandoned. That's the thing of the past for, for now, for this year. You know, you can um, city hop, if you like, every hour. Um, so, again, that just makes it um, easier to tap into different investors. But the logistical side of it makes it a bit more tricky. So that puts further demands on the IR function from a logistical and planning perspective. Um, I think if you think about it more, um, not from an investor perspective, but as an internal perspective, you know, working remotely, um, managing teams virtually, again, all of that's tough. Um, it's manageable and people are finding their feet. But um, in an environment where in IR, you often have to work at speed uh, and sometimes reactive rather than proactive, it, it adds further strain, I'd say, on teams. So a platform or, or a plan that allows you to have regular catch-ups um, with your team members is really important so that everyone's on the same page and everyone's privy to the same information. 
um, because you lose a lot by by not being next to each other physically in offices, etc. Um, from a recruitment perspective, uh, I think interviewing, hiring, onboarding, all of that being done remotely is now the norm. But initially, you know, a year ago, companies put complete hiring freezes in place um, with so much uncertainty on how the pandemic would plan would play out. Um, there was definitely a reluctance um, to make hiring decisions without face to face meetings. And it's somewhat um, counterintuitive that because if you put a hiring freeze in a function that needs, as we just said earlier, we have more demands to, to, to communicate with more people. It's really it's a really difficult um, struggle. And, and a lot of people, again, when I was doing the global interview series, a lot of people said they just don't have the right resources um, and set up for the team. Um, and and so I think you know we'll, again we'll talk about that but but planning for that is really important. I think as we turn into 2021, what I've definitely seen is a catch up effect um, from last year. So there's almost been a flurry of new opportunities and new roles. And um, I've probably had my busiest quarter in Q1 um, that I've ever had in seven years. And uh, I think as I said, I think it's a catch up and lagged effect from last year. Um, there's a much greater proportion of contract temporary opportunities um, than the previously are have been at this time of year. And I think a number of reasons are for that. One is the immediate need, the speed of getting someone in um, quickly and, and contractors generally, you know, the process is quicker and they can there's no notice period. They come into a business and, and run with it quite quickly. Um, there's still a lot of uncertainty uh, in the market. And the and the um, economy. So I think again, contracts carry much less risk as it's not a permanent fixed cost for a business. Um, and it's like a try before you buy. So it's it's almost like um, you know testing the waters. A lot of the contracts do go permanent. Um, but I think CEOs, some some CFOs who are at a halfway house in terms of how invested in IR they are, don't need to spend the money to invest permanently. Um, so you just just kind of wrapping up what I would say is is 2021 is show, definitely showing demand for high quality kind of ambitious individuals um, the IPO pipeline in London kind of ground to a halt last year. It's now thriving this year um, that in itself is good news for IR professionals, it creates new opportunities, new roles. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that would be my view in terms of things we've seen and things that we need to factor into our kind of IR programmes and plans for, for this year. Debbie, as always, a very, very helpful overview. And I like the way you stress that top down view, because often we're asked about IR and the C-suite. Sometimes we don't talk enough about IR and the board. And I think given we've all managed um, admirably in very difficult circumstances, the worst circumstances in generations, I think it's imperative that IR reinforces to pick up on your point, their ability to work internally to ensure that they get the support, the profile and the resources they require. And it's a nice segue into introducing Ryan again, because we talk about Best IR program 2020. Clearly, Ryan, we don't uh, expect you to share all your secrets, but I think, first of all, before we get into how you plan for, how you resource, and frankly, how you win IR, excuse the expression, everybody in the audience, but by that I just mean we all get we're in a competition for attention, we all get we're in a competition for capital, and, and clearly Al Raji Bank have done that, not, not just with the um, recent awards, but historically anyway, certainly from, from Mira's point of view, we know that. But I wanted to start, Ryan, with your organization, because I think the other thing that I picked up from Debbie is this resourcing issue or this organizational issue. And if you can't get it right internally, then you can't really be expected to do it externally with all the stakeholders that, that Debbie mentioned. So perhaps to, to start with, just a brief introduction to IR at Al Raji, how you're organized, how you're resourced, and then we'll talk in detail about some of the other things that you're doing so well. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for having me and uh, thank you to Dawul and Mira for uh, arranging the session. I'm uh, very happy to be along with you and the panelists John, Leila and Debbie. 
And um, uh, to be honest, uh, I just want to congratulate the team in Rajhi who were uh, heading the IR uh, in 2020. I would like to join you also for con congratulating them. Uh, Faisal, he was with us uh, on the call. So uh, good job, Faisal, and our CFO, uh, uh, Abdurrahman Fadda and uh, Amr Sagir. Uh, they were uh, doing an uh, outstanding job in 2020. Uh, so, uh, having said that, uh, from uh, a Rajhi perspective, to be honest, um, uh, I believe one of the most important things that help us to win this uh, award uh, is the management buy-in. So, the management buy-in uh, for the IR function as a strategic function in the organization has been clearly uh, done uh, through the previous years. If you look at uh, uh, the past uh, three, four years, uh, IR team in Rajhi Bank won uh, five awards uh, from MIRA. Um, that was started in 2018, most improved IR team, and then best IR uh, in the Middle East and KSA in 2019, best CFO, our CFO back then, Abdullah Khalifa, uh, best CFO in the Middle East, and uh, our head of IR back then, uh, Amr Sagir, uh, won the best uh, IR professional. And lastly, the award that we get from the Dowell, uh, it, it shows clearly how our management is focusing on IR as a strategic function, function within the organization. That that helped us uh, to uh, deliver that uh, messages to our investors and keep engaging with them uh, actively. Uh, and the organization, uh, from an organization perspective, uh, here we have the head of the IR team reporting directly to CFO, and they are uh, actively engaging with our CEO and uh, the chief of strategy uh, to understand where the organization is going and um, uh, to help uh, in uh, arranging the calls with investors uh, and earning calls that will help us to engage also other C-levels within the company if we get the support from the higher uh, C-level uh, within, uh, within the organization. Thank you very much. So clearly well supported from the top, which is what we expect. And I think it's a, it's a great example to everybody else and clearly well resourced. And I just want to take your background into IR because as I said, interestingly enough, often you find in organizations that there is a bit of a, a split between the functions and it's fine provided they're all coordinated and they're all pulling in same direction but you clearly bring some very very big technical skills in terms of liquidity management i mentioned money markets i think investment is in your former title as well and i'm just fascinated to put it into the context for our other uh, iros that of course debt and equity are uh, two sides of the same coin excuse me saying that debbie or of the balance sheet um and, and brian's laughing but he knows what I mean. And if you, if you take that financial expertise, those what I would describe as very technical, if not hard skills, I'm sure you came into the head of IR role, Ryan, thinking, right, everybody should basically get everything that I get since you've been managing the, the bank balance sheet. How do you then turn that into what Debbie was suggesting, particularly after the year we've had, into what might be described as softer skills, whether team management, um, whether leadership, um, and indeed keeping everybody able to play to their strengths as, as opposed to just thinking it's a financial function, which clearly it isn't. It's a much more uh, multifaceted, holistic type function. I'd just be interested on your take, given the move that you made. Yeah. So uh, back in uh, my role within the Treasury, I used to uh, be involved with the investment portfolio of the bank, uh, which include uh, many uh, yani communication between us and the IR teams and other organizations. So that, uh, along with my technical skills, helped me when I moved to the IR team uh, to build that combination between uh, knowing what an investor would like to know and what we like uh, when we we are communicating with the IR teams what kind of information that we want from them. Uh, back at um, my treasury time, uh, 
uh, we get uh, involved in many uh, road shows when it comes to uh, debt issuances or even for our equity portfolio. Um, the type of access to management and knowing where the company is going, uh, those were the main, main points that we would like to see uh, from an IR team to provide us with a guidance on the company outlook. Because when you look at it from an analyst or an investor, uh, what they want to know is that they want to, uh, your performance, uh, they know it, the current performance, they know it, it's there in the financials, but they want to build their future outlook of the company uh, and the organization uh, from the current performance along with the uh, view in the future. So uh, that both those items uh, should be there um, uh, within the skills of the IR team to understand the strategy of the organization and the current performance. So when they communicate to the market, they will give them the uh, kind of information that they're looking for. Um, because I, what I believe in the IR team, what they should help analysts and investors is to get the right valuation of the company and if there is a potential when it comes to uh, jumping in into that uh, company from an early stage uh, it will help the, the investors uh, jumping uh, jumping in early and that will help also to provide the confidence level within the organization so those kind of sets uh, all, to, all together help me uh, to make that move and that's what I'm trying to do here uh, when I joined the team I have learned uh, some things from Faisal and the team and CFO uh, when it comes to the communication, uh, uh, how to uh, approach the market and those kind of details. But uh, the technical skills, I have uh, bring it with me to uh, support that also. Well, I'm sure Debbie would agree and she's welcome to chip in. But when you look at the attributes of successful IR officers, successful IR teams, um, it's, it's essentially made up of multiple skills and of course we've never met one individual that's actually managed to to boast all the skills and if Debbie can correct me if I'm wrong but um, generally certainly in my experience the most successful companies in presenting in ensuring that the perception received externally is based on an incredible team effort and just to put it into the context of the last 12 months clearly leadership was at a premium Debbie mentioned communications were at a premium. And perhaps it's no surprise, as Debbie was suggesting, that actually, you know, it's easy to take IR for granted. It's easy to take ourselves for granted and forget, well, hang on, we're actually in tremendous demand because if I go back to the competition for attention, competition for capital, those that stood out as Al Raji Bank did, among others, of course. Um, were those that I imagine were most visible, most present. And of course, to see the leadership from top through to IR and indeed across the organization is, I'm sure, what addresses all stakeholders best, whether your own employees internally, whether your customers in the branches or online, or indeed coming back to where we are, the investment community. And I'm just trying to get a a handle, Ryan, before I go back to Debbie, on what some of the key decisions made in the past 12 months were. Because if I cast my mind back literally a year ago, it was just dawning on us that we were all going into this dreadful um, period and we didn't know when we were going to come out of this period. Debbie's mentioned we obviously had to transition into a more digital world, elements of which will remain with us. But at the end of the day, investor relations is called investor relations because you really do need to have that contact. You really do need to be able to look people in the eye and basically, as Debbie said, um, ensure that you have their trust both ways, whether you're on the buy side, sell side, or indeed on the company side. And I'm just trying to um, get my mind around your IR program 2020, at least in terms of some of the big decisions that were made to ensure that the world knew that our Raji Bank was still um, sailing uh, beautifully and still delivering on its key performance indicators and the world could see that. Um, clearly there was a base for that but also I'm sure there were some big decisions that would have to be made like with everybody else in terms of that, that horrible three to six month period that 
that sort of started in 2020, but frankly has continued into 2021? Difficult question, and as always, very long-winded way from me. So I'll be quiet now, Ryan. Okay, so uh, I, I echo your voice when it comes to the uncertainty uh, back in 2020, but I want to take a step even uh, further back in 2018-19. Uncertainty at that time was the main risk uh, for par uh, market participants. Uh, due to many reasons, U.S.-China trade wars, uh, uh, trade tensions, and then uh, Brexit and uh, geopolitical tension, uh, especially in the Middle East. And then you move to 2020, where uh, we are facing a new virus spreading quickly. We don't know. Uh, there is no vaccine. Uh, future outlook is not clear. So I, I think the management decision at that time, we want to address that uncertainty because it's an important thing that for our investors. We have seen a huge sell-off in the market during March time uh, across the globe uh, and that uh, required uh, being a proactive management when it comes to communicating to the market. So what the management have done, uh, they uh, try to, uh, within the uh, IR material, uh, to provide some highlight on the risks that we are facing. Uh, and if you see it within all of our IR materials, whether it's uh, investor presentation, earning calls, uh, and, and other materials, uh, it, it highlighted what are the main risks that we are for, for, uh, facing in the market, what are we doing in our Rajhi, and then uh, we uh, try to make a separate slide uh, tailored to foreign investors to show them the government initiatives locally, uh, what, what they uh, are doing within the, in the market. So for them to understand, most of the foreign investors are not available in the market, so they, they might hear some of the initiatives from the government. However, we want to elaborate more on that just to give them the assurance of uh, what the economy looks like, and especially um, for a bank, you know, uh, as being the heart of the economy, uh, we, we were getting so many uh, questions from the market when it comes to uh, the economic outlook. So we also try to blend the macroeconomic uh, view of uh, the uh, local uh, economy. So uh, those items uh, helped us to shape our message uh, moving forward in 2020. Uh, we have also tried to increase the level of engagement from the sea level. Uh, we have introduced our uh, CRO, uh, Chief Risk Officer, to our earning call. Uh, since uh, we were getting so many questions about the credit, the risks, uh, the business continuity, uh, so uh, that helped us to uh, provide the market participants who are following Rajhi to, to have a clear vision of what we are doing when it comes to managing the risks that we are facing. and. Um, uh, in addition, we have also released a, a statement in Tadawal regarding the impact of uh, uh, the pandemic on our financial performance, and we have shared that with all of our investors. Uh, that was back in April, I believe. Uh, and at the end of the year, and during our earning call uh, for the full year, we have uh, also invited uh, our GM retail, the head of retail business, since we have uh, done outstanding performance when it comes to the mortgage uh, financing portfolio. So that will help also the investors to uh, understand what we are doing uh, from the head of the business itself. Uh, so uh, those mainly the items that we are uh, uh, from a management level, uh, again, from the IR team, uh, we, we try to keep all the channels open. Uh, technology has helped us, as Debbie mentioned, that we can uh, move in from uh, one city to another within one hour. So that helped us to get the communication active between our investors and the IR team. Um, we have to, we, we try to make sure that we have a public, the publication of uh, the IR material consistent on quarterly basis, um, uh, investor presentation, earning call, transcript, uh, data supplement. We, uh, Our CFO always following up with us if we publish it or not on the right time. And, um, uh, the, uh, and the most important thing, I believe, it's 
the uh, the IR material shouldn't be only focusing on the financial performance of the company. It, it should also include the uh, risk factors that you, you are facing, how you are addressing them, and uh, a macro, as I mentioned, a macroeconomic update, uh, just for them to understand the industry that you are uh, you are operating in. Uh, that will help the analysts and uh, investor to assess the operating environment of the organization. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, th those mainly the items I believe that helped us uh, for our program in 2020. Most comprehensive, Ryan, and what stood out to me in what you just said was the involvement across the bank, including the business lines, because as you said, at the end of the day, they're the, the guys or ladies driving the individual businesses. They're the ones at the sharp end. And in many ways, IR is a collector of all that information and in many ways a distiller of that information to advise management and the board how best to present that information so that, as you said, over time, investors can see fair value based on excellent financials, I'm sure. And I think both Debbie and I know, having worked in banks as well, that the beauty of working in the banking sector, as you just said, Ryan, is you're at the heart of um, the economy. In many ways, you're the lifeblood of the economy because you're producing funding for the economy. And therefore, you get an incredible macroeconomic snapshot at any point in time. So I think in, in some ways, the banking sector had big advantages because it's a way of thinking. You described it as risk management, which I think is spot on. But before I come back to you on the broader risk factors, if not the ESG factors, so factors pertaining to bigger um, issues around other stakeholders, whether environmental, social, or governance. I'm just going to quickly turn to Debbie, because I have a question, Debbie, that fits in quite nicely here before we get back to the ESG and IR, which clearly can't be spoken of um, without thinking of, of the other these days, quite rightly. And I think you, you preface that, Debbie. There's someone here asking, if they're relatively new to IR, having listened to everything we've just described, I hope we're not putting them off, in terms of the technical skills or the hard skills, what's the weighting between that, but also the quite complex people skills, soft skills, team skills, leadership skills. So as a, as a search firm, um, DNA Today quite pleasingly said, well, there's lots of opportunities because there was a lag effect and suddenly there's a day of reckoning in terms of, well, you better have been externally facing, you better have been communicating. What are the skill sets that you think are a minimum? And if I don't come to the table with the minimum my the technical or soft skills, how do I develop my IR career, Debbie? That's a good question. Um, I think the first and foremost thing that I would say, and the reason why I believe I can successfully, you know, when I sell my services to clients, CFOs, CEOs, the reason I believe that I can be successful is because at the top of my list, um, what I believe, and, and many clients of mine also believe, is the cultural fit is absolutely paramount. So, as you said earlier, John, you're not going to find a candidate that ticks every single box, um, but there'll be some that tick more than others. Um, but the first and foremost thing is, do they fit within the culture of the organisation? So to give you a flavour of that, I'm working pre presently at the moment with a with a big global um, FTSE 100 business, and they are within the digital tech space. They are running before they can walk. They're hugely fast paced. They're acquisitive. They're growing rapidly. And there aren't, they can't keep the processes as quick as the business is moving. So someone, the right cultural fit for that business is someone that can move along at that speed without feeling um, frightened or afraid or, or, or indeed can't thrive within that type of environment. So the cultural fit is absolutely paramount. Technical versus softer skills, it's a hard call. I don't think I could um put a number on it i think clients have different priorities again that will depend on does ir sit within a finance function does it sit within a comms function sometimes if it is more of a comsy type ir role they're less bothered about having a technical accountancy qualification or cfa uh but again other factors that play into that or it or, or what does the team look like so has the team 
between them got the, the financial and technical background because if someone else does then perhaps actually a really nice mix is to have someone that doesn't have that but brings something else to the table so you've got the diversity across you all um i mean the bare minimum i would say is 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 a financial or capital markets understanding um, and communications being able to you know the interpersonal skills being able to to talk um build rapport with people and be able to work with very senior stakeholders again if you're at your very early stages of your career it can be quite daunting to, to the thought of going to sit in front of a cfo or a CF ceo i know when i started our off i started at barclays actually and our office was outside the ceo's desk and when the share price tanked um ex div day was always a brilliant one um but we always had it in the diary prepared but he'd always come over and he'd always say what's happening with the share price or you know what's going on in the markets and you're caught off guard but you've got to be able to cope with that pressure um and it's not for everyone um but it is a, an essential part of ir i would say i hope that answers the question and then john i'm happy to kind of move on to more of the kpi stuff after if you want as well yeah thanks a lot debbie i too started at barclays so no better starting ground than than barclays but i am we're kidding <laughs> 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 let, 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 let's, uh, let's go back to Ryan. But before I do, since that question came from someone who also said, if I'm new or if I was starting out, could I just remind them that in Saudi Arabia, Mira works very closely with Tadawul, who work very closely with the CMA, who of course have the Financial Academy that offers a wonderful array of courses for the financial services sector and the capital market sector including the certified IR officer. So for that individual who asked that excellent question, which Debbie just responded, please do consult the Financial Academy um, and find out what they're offering. And if it is for IR, then I couldn't do better than recommend a very broad-based foundation course that really covers everything you ought to be thinking about. And then as Debbie quite rightly said, you then build on your own strengths, you find a fit with an organization that's going to look after you, develop you, and hopefully um, make sure that you add something as well. But thanks a lot for that, that Debbie. So very, very uh, timely and helpful. And if I go back to broader stakeholders, I think one of the features, Debbie, that you mentioned, and of course, Ryan picked up on as well, is we can't really talk about IR without talking about broader stakeholders. And if we didn't learn anything um, through the past 12 months, um, it's surely that people come first, however we describe people, um, whichever acronym we put them in. And one of the things for that inquirer with that excellent question about starting out is one of the problems with our industry is we love jargon, we love acronyms, and we assume everybody knows what we're talking about, including when we talk about ESG, when nothing could be further from the truth, Ryan. So when we talk about ESG, it clearly means different things to different businesses because fundamentally it's about, you mentioned it, risk factors and what's material to your business and what, frankly, you use internally to make sure that you remain on track before being comfortable about reporting that externally. And I know there's lots of discussions, including in the UK, Debbie, about um, trying to mandate more forcefully uh, reporting on some of these non-financial factors, for want of a better expression. But at the end of the day, knowing and having been at the sharp end, I'm hoping that Ryan will give his own take on it. It's really for the people running the business to determine how best to run the business and how best to report on that business while accepting clearly whether we like it or not. There's a undertow, a swirl of more um, needs for more people, quite rightly, because we've just been through a global pandemic. And I think there's louder voices coming from other quarters over and above our dear investment community that's suggesting, you know, if you do apply ESG as broadly as, as you can, then frankly, um, you're, you're opening up something, something quite complex and something quite difficult to easily address. But I do know that our Raji Bank do a sustainability report and do link it very, very nicely to the annual report. And I'm sure that's one of the reasons why you're um, coming out on top, Ryan. So again, a very wordy, lengthy, John Golifer IR <laughs> comms approach. Ryan, say something sensible, please. Okay, so when it comes honestly to ESG, I believe it's uh, 
the, the focus now is going uh, from the investment committee on SEASD, and uh, we are here learning from and this new journey that we had started back in 2018. And um, I'll, I'll share with you some of the, the things that we are doing. Uh, probably that will be of an interest uh, to the audience. Uh, so um, we started the focus on ESG by, uh, back in late 2017, early 2018, when we, uh, when we published our standalone ESG report. Uh, and then we we decided to have a separate section within our annual report uh, for 2019 and 2020, uh, focusing on ESG uh, instead of having a standalone uh, report. So um, I believe that currently the market is moving from a focus on CSR only to a broader uh, concept of ESG. Uh, the, uh, from the market currently here in Saudi, uh, there is uh, low hanging fruits uh, for uh, all uh, companies, uh, given the culture that we have in Saudi and the region that uh, very uh, supportive charity giving and support to those so it's unfortunate. Uh, so uh, the social aspect is, is very, uh, I, I believe most of the market are uh, doing very well on that item. But when it comes to the environment and the governance is where we see some of the investors usually highlighting. Uh, however, uh, we, we're trying to learn from what we have done in the past, uh, see what the, the things that we have done uh, in, in, a, in a good way uh, through linking it, uh, the, some KPIs to our strategy uh, back then at that time, and then uh, put some KPIs. And most importantly is that to uh, be a bit brave and try to put those uh, items and KPIs in the iron material and uh, communicating that to investors because that will put some pressure on the organization to try to improve uh, moving forward. Uh, so we have done that in the past. Uh, we have done it on our uh, call on a quarterly basis and investor presentation. Uh, we put some numbers there. There, uh, to show our performance when it comes to ESG and uh, to highlight the improvement that we have done. And uh, moving forward, uh, we are having a new strategy within the bank. And what we are trying to do is to, again, align some of the ESG uh, items uh, along with the uh, overall strategy of the bank, try to find the KPI that go along with the strategy uh, so we can draft the KPIs around it so we can track it uh, and link it to the performance of uh, different uh, entities within the organization. Um, uh, and one of the things that I believe is uh, will help uh, many organizations when it comes to ESG is try to look at the items uh, that that it, it will not only help you to just to do the right thing it will also uh, give you a good business uh, that will improve your uh, bottom line uh, it will be uh, an easier to sell to the top management to support you uh, for items that uh, related to ESG. I think you hit the nail on the head i mean because if it isn't business led if it doesn't make business sense then frankly you wouldn't be in business and correct me if i'm wrong debbie because i'm going to come to you next i mean when we talk about esg i i think sustainable business meaning long-term business that's going to get you through thick and thin as, as we saw over the past year but i'm interested debbie to go to you because you would have worked across different markets you'd have seen different practices different responses. So give us a perspective from where you sit while recognizing that when we talk about the Middle East, um, of course, it isn't just good old Saudi Arabia, which is our biggest capital market. It's such a diverse region with so many different starting points with different agenda, different resources, and frankly, different capacity to do some of the things that maybe some of those stakeholders are demanding. Um, and it doesn't happen over overnight, as, as Ryan was just suggesting. Debbie. Hi, yeah, thanks. I think actually, first thing I'll say is we're at a really interesting point here um, as we lead up to the AGM season. So um, there's a lot of expectations and there's a lot of there's been a lot of discussion around what we're expecting to see. Um, so the pandemic has you know, obviously placed companies under a lot of scrutiny regarding ESG and probably more so now than ever before. Um, and I think there will be pressure points as we go into the AGM 2021 
um, season around disclosure, um, engagement, and also, you know, whether remuneration is, is kind of balancing the interest of, of the company's stakeholders. There's been um, furlough schemes and all sorts, government handing out, handing out grants here. And for businesses that have drawn on some of those resources, they have to make sure they align um, remuner executive remuneration. So again, that's an area that's been really scrutinized. Um, and I think, you know, uh, Ryan said about KPIs and putting some of the numbers in your disclosures, you know, more and more companies are are, are looking at that as, as the norm. Um, the other thing to factor in is is the increased um, kind of reliance or importance of these research providers such as like ISS um, and where people maybe didn't take much uh, accountability or they themselves didn't carry much authority. Nowadays, some of these um, questionnaires that you might get sent or forms to fill in about your ESG efforts are, are really paramount and they can't be ignored. And you know, they have to have a dedicated resource internally who's going to take responsibility for ensuring it's fully completed because the weight that they carry spreads and disseminates across the entire investment community. And it could be a decision. Uh, firstly, it will be um, it, the results of that will go to a specific investor base. Um, so those investors that are only interested in investing in companies that tick certain boxes. Um, so it's uh, opening up a pool of capital for companies is really important. I think um, the other thing I would say, and, and Ryan would probably, I think you alluded to it, is that ESG policies are, uh, evolve over time. So they're, they're not static policies. And I think companies need to recognise that you have to be flexible. So wherever you're starting from, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's where your end goal is and where you and that end goal might keep changing, but it's how you get there and, and the regular update of policies throughout as well. Um, it, again, going back to the digital, these virtual AGMs are basically going to help investors kind of um, gain better access to companies, you know, far afield that they would never have had access to. So I think going, you know, I think it will really um, be scrutinised as a topic ESG. Um, and, and then from a recruitment perspective, which which helps to demonstrate how the weight that's being put on ESG at the moment, particularly in the UK, I mean, candidates are upskilling in ESG to make them a standout candidate. Going back to um, the question asked before, if you're new coming into IR and, and, and where do I place between technical and um, softer skills, those candidates that have ESG on their CV now are, are ranked higher as well. It's another string to your bow. Um, it's something that would draw you into a company compared to those that don't have it. Um, so there are um, courses that people are doing. Um, there's specific agencies that focus on ESG that, that corporates are using as an outsource solution. Um, there's ESG standalone roles that are being created that basically sit alongside IR um, and ensure that all of the reporting from an ESG perspective is integrated into all the IR reporting and I think as Ryan said at the very end you know it ensures that ESG just becomes a way of doing business rather than just a report um, and that's how you get your management your board on, on side with everything um, again you know I'm working with um, FTSE 100 now who underneath the director of IR and comms he's carved out a new role ahead of ESG um, a FTSE 250 that I've just worked with um, on an IR manager vacancy, the reason the vacancy came about is because the person that was in that role is having the ESG aspect carved out and is doing ESG exclusively for, for the group. Um, and that's a three billion um, sterling company. So I don't think size actually matters, quite frankly. I think um, irrespective, if, you've, if you're a public company, you've got reporting requirements, ESG has to be the bread and butter of, of what you do. Um, that's my kind of thoughts on it. Yeah, thanks, Debbie. And what we're seeing in the region is more and more jurisdictions are introducing at least um, guidelines, because I think one of the challenges for the companies we certainly speak to is when you talk about these well-known, well-meaning acronyms internationally, they clearly have different starting points and they mean different things all over the world. And one of the problems is trying to address who you think your target audiences are and what you think they are actually looking at. And of course, there's a complete alphabet soup of ESG, excuse me saying it, in terms of the standards 
for the surveys or the, the measures that you're asked to respond to. So Debbie, it's a difficult one, but given where we are going into 2021 with a captive audience thinking about essentials of IR, if they're asked by their management to measure the value of their IR, what sort of KPIs do you think are most relevant in this age? And I say that because you also mentioned the digital world, access, market reach, and in many ways, it's addressing the next generation as well, because the next generation is certainly far more uh, literate, tech savvy, digital <laughs> than I'll ever be. Um, and clearly, with the world changing, our IR better be changing, Debbie. So, what do you tell your your senior management on board? How should we be measured? That's a really good question, and I think you won't be surprised for me to say, and it's not a cop out, is that there isn't one way to measure. I mean, there's going to be it's unique to every company, right? Um, as is an IR program, as is everything. Um, the one thing is obviously consistency is key. So you have to implement KPIs and then continue reporting on those KPIs. It's like doing external reporting. Um, you know, if you look at um, strategic goals for an, uh, uh, you know, a small cap company, it might be to diversify the share register internationally, while a mega cap company might be to uh, improve shareholder communications, increase analyst coverage and um, quality of, of analysts. Um, I think um, what I would say is, you know, there will be new factors, new KPI factors that come into any IR team um, off the back of the, the year that we've just had. Um, and I think, you know, making sure one is is make in order to plan for that, making sure your team is appropriately resourced and skilled with an ESG um, uh, accountability or someone that's responsible for that is really important. Um, so obviously that's not a, a quantitative measure as a KPI. But equally, um, as part of your planning, you set your team structure and, and demonstrate what that might look like going forwards. Um, the other thing I would say from a kind of planning perspective is um, make sure that, you know, as, as we've all talked about, what's happened, the digital world has enabled us to tap into lots of different investors. Make sure you don't forget about them. Make sure you follow up with them. So anyone new that's just heard your story, they want consistency too. So go back to those same investors and continue the story and how you've progressed and how you've moved on. Um, and I think that will be um, very much welcomed as well. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, is, again, as part of your planning, you know, conferences, um, you know, have a have an IR plan, if you like, of, of what conferences you want to attend. Um, and, and you can turn that quantitative as a, K, as a KPI in terms of what you set out to, to do um, and, and what you actually do. Um, I mean, one, flipping it, one thing I would say that doesn't work is when IR teams have measures that rely on share price or liquidity as a KPI in markets like we've just been through, it just is totally disheartening and demotivating. So I think I would, my advice would be to steer clear of those ones. Now, obviously, as part of remuneration packages, you need to have an element of that, but that can't be the key indicator. Um, as we've all just, you know, seen, I think um, there's got to be things that you can actually impact and control rather than ones that we're unable to influence like a global pandemic. <laughs> um, so so summing up, I know we're, we're running out of time, but summing up, I think agility is key as well. I think that um, for all the will in the world, you could have set your KPIs in January 2020 and by March, all of those could have been out the window and you've got to adapt to a new environment and you put new plans in place. Um, if you're too rigid, again it's not going to work as an ir function so you know agility to, to be able to move with digital digital advancements and um, new resources etc i think is key I, I think that's very well put i'm gonna ask ryan just to chip in if he's got any additional thoughts around what what's clearly important because one of the most common questions we get is oh you know we're seen as a cost center Management's always asking us how we should be measured, how do we demonstrate value? And I think you actually put it very plainly and very helpfully, Debbie, by saying, well, you know, like all sensible things, manage what you can actually control. And it can be as simple as the number of houses covering you in terms of research. And if your peers are being covered by a few more people, well, why aren't you? Shouldn't you be working towards getting that coverage as well? 
Um, you mentioned the IR planning, which is obviously essential in terms of target audiences. Well, do you actually get to meet those audiences and ultimately do you convert those audiences into the share register? And so many other ways of measuring performance for individuals, teams, while aligning everything with what the organization and the management is thinking and doing. So on that note, before I come back to you, Debbie, with any um, key takeaway that you might wish to leave with the audience, although you've covered so much already, I'm just going to turn to Ryan and see if you want to just chip in on KPIs, because obviously, as you said, Debbie, it's a tough one. It depends because it's different for everybody and every organization. But what's been our Raji Bank's experience, Ryan? What works? So uh, again, um, similar to what uh, Debbie mentioned, I, I think those are uh, very valid points when it comes to things that you have control of, um, like the IR material communication, uh, what the uh, the producing of those material, how the market is uh, perception on that, uh, uh, what kind of information that you are providing, and the um, shareholder split between institutional and retail. Uh, for us uh, here in the region, the QFI, uh, the foreign orange ownership, uh, it's uh, another uh, uh, capability eyes that uh, you, we might consider. Uh, also, when it comes to ESG, as uh, as they mentioned, sometimes it will be uh, hard to measure that and put it within the KPI. Um, uh, one of the things that we might you might consider is uh, to look at the ownership of uh, ESG uh, funds that uh, uh, holding uh, the company. So that will give you an indicator how you are uh, ESG friendly when it comes to investor uh, buying in to your stock. Um, those mainly the points that I want to add it. Thanks, Ryan. And another question coming in on ESG, which essentially says um, it's difficult to compare apples with apples, um, clearly across any market. Is there any move towards some sort of convergence? Well, there is. And Debbie, I mean, feel free to chip in. But if I look at it in broad terms, my own experience of um, non-financial or broader reporting was based around something that's called GRI, which is Global Reporting Initiative. And it's essentially a European-based, European-driven view of non-financial and financial reporting that's been around for, well, certainly when I was uh, in my last IR role over a decade ago, so that's quite a long time in ESG standards. And at the same time, in America, um, they've developed more recently their own version of that, which comes under something called SASB. Now, people are going to ask, well, what does SASB stand for? I can tell you that it has sustainability in it, and it's clearly standards. And there's somebody else that can tell you what the A and the B are. Debbie, you don't know what SASB stands for, do you? I think it's um, something, something, sustainability. Forget it. Anyway. SASB, S-A-S-B, Alicia, I hope you're looking this up for me and you can chip in. S-A-S-B is almost like the equivalent of GRI that I mentioned in European terms. And I think the challenge for regulators, even governments now, including in the UK, is trying to get some sense from the different takes on sustainability reporting. And Debbie will know that um, we've got some very, very powerful groups in the UK that are being led by either former policymakers, and I'm thinking of um, Mark Carney, I can't remember what his acronym for his task force is, but it's a UN related task force. Um, there are other such bodies. And I think one of the difficulties is trying to converge or integrate all that to answer the question I just got, which is, you know, there isn't an apples for apples comparison. And that's a challenge, but I do know in this region, the regulators, the exchanges are at least trying to embrace what they're seeing and putting it to the companies to try and explain what they think is material. And in many ways, I'd argue, as I'm sure Ryan would and Debbie as well, that it's as much bottom up, meaning coming from your own business point of view, as it is um, being, what's the best way of putting it, um, a burden on you or imposed on you. And it's not supposed to be, it's supposed to be, as we said, a good way or a better way, as Ryan explained, to run your business. Now, I, I don't know whether that was a particularly satisfactory answer for that, for that question, but it's a good question and a difficult question. Before I, I wrap up, I'm just going to see if 
any of our speakers just wants to leave you with any parting comments before I wrap up. And uh, Leila, feel free to jump in as well. We've still got a few minutes because we started a few minutes late. So um, please feel free to do so. I'll start with Debbie. Thanks, John. Yeah, just thinking about it, and I know we're short on time, so I'll be quick, but I think if I was to leave you with any key takeaways for, for managing an IR program um, for the next uh, year, I guess from experience, things that I would say are, it's and actually it's irrespective of the pandemic, this is just absolute essential, is, is building your internal network first. You can't, my view is you cannot successfully deliver an IR program until you've got your internal stakeholders on board. Now, in some jurisdictions and regions, obviously it's an educational piece internally because they don't really know what IR does. So it's completely paramount, um, including junior and senior people, make sure they, in order for them to value what you do, they need to understand what you do. So you can do lunch and learn sessions, you can invite them into webinars, conference calls, let them hear what happens when you're on an analyst call. Um, because I, I really I really believe that they won't be able to provide you with the information at speed or understand why you need it until they, they understand your role. Um, the second thing is let analysts and investors see and feel as much of your business as you can. And I know Ryan talked about bringing your chief risk officer in as well. Um, I think that's a brilliant idea and it's much easier to do in these more, in, you know, in, on the technology um, platforms that we're using. Another thing is um, people are often using pre-recorded um, materials and, and doing digital markets days. Um, so it's all pre-recorded and then you do a live Q&A. And I think that the point is be creative about how you can tap into global investor bases efficiently um, by showing them your premises, your products that perhaps you might not have been able to do before COVID because the chances of getting them out to your region are, are, are slimmer. Um, regular board updates, I'm sure you're all doing that. Don't forget that this is a two-way communication and I tell all my candidates that, that you often think it's about taking the company strategy and financials and performance out to the market, but it's equally as important to bring the market feedback and the intel back to the board, back to the management team. And that quite often is the tricky part of the role because sometimes you have to deal with quite sensitive information, but, but it's paramount to the success of an IR function. Um, and the only other thing I'll leave you with, which is recruitment related, is, is from a resourcing perspective, with the rise of flexible working, home working, et cetera, I think it opens, companies are, are now open to kind of global pools of talent, um, and therefore don't, you know, you can utilize your experiences across international borders that perhaps would have been more tricky without a relocation. Think about contractors to fill immediate gaps. Um, and uh, also, you know, there's, there's a rise of IR consultancy firms too, which a lot of people, because they brought the IR role is broadened, a lot of people are using as in addition to their IR function, not instead of, um, if that makes sense. So that would be my uh, overview. <laughs> Super, very comprehensive, and it makes it a bit difficult for anybody else. But <laughs> Raya, Raya, you've got That's to speak to Anne. Yeah, I was planning to say it will be difficult to answer that question after the. <laughs> uh, so again, I just will highlight some of the points quickly. Uh, understanding the strategy of the company is uh, is very important uh, because you are drafting the story of your company uh, and the future of the company uh, based on your current performance. So investors are always looking for future outlooks uh, that will help them to uh, make a decision on uh, investment decision. And um, the continuous engagement, as mentioned by the way, with the internal and external stakeholders. So will help you to uh, give a, a two-way feedback uh, from uh, the market to the internal uh, uh, stakeholders uh, that it's also an important point and uh, learning from the uh, peers in the market uh, attending webinars like this one and uh, we are fortunate here to have uh, Mira and Tadawul that uh, set up something uh, like this uh, uh, a community of profession for IR to uh, help each other and uh, build the value uh, for an IR within the market and uh, finally uh, I, I believe one of the questions that we received for, from uh, a, new, a new to the IR uh, guy 
Uh, I think the toolkit also that Tadawil is uh, putting on their website is very helpful. It helped me a lot uh, when I uh, first joined the IR team. Um, it's very comprehensive, uh, highlight many of the aspects that uh, IR uh, team would uh, expect. So uh, that's for me. Thank you. Goodness me. Well, I must say it couldn't have been easier when you've got a Ryan and a Debbie. Um, I think you, you've said it all. Leila, I don't know whether you just want to make any parting comments before I, I wrap up, but um, that was an outstanding, outstanding I discussion. To thank you, John, Debbie, and Brian, for uh, having this a very rich dialogue um, and hosting this webinar alongside. And just to answer, uh, reiterate what Ryan has said, uh, IR toolkit on Tadawa's website would be mostly very beneficial for that person who posted that question. And lastly, John, that uh, you asked about SA SAS. SAS stands for Sustainability Accounting and uh, Standards Board, the nonprofit organization you were referencing. Goodness uh, me, Leila. Well, amazing. Thank you so much. No wonder I couldn't remember it. I still can't remember what, what it stands for. Just wanted to, to say one last remark. Uh, we look forward to hosting more uh, workshops and webinars of the same sort. And we look forward to having all of our um, issuers attending those um, series of workshops alongside with Mira. And that's it from my end. Thank you. Well, again, on behalf of Mira, thank you so much, Leila and team at Tadawal. Obviously, we any of these events without your tremendous support and help and we thoroughly enjoy working with you and I know there's lots more to come in 2021. Clearly we can't have practical discussions that leave you with key takeaways unless we get quality speakers like Ryan and a wonderful international view from, from Debbie. And I'll just end on one point which Alethea has reminded me of and that will be uh, launching the Middle East IR Practitioner Survey which I actually touched upon because Debbie has actually worked with us in the past on it. And I just throw to you in the audience the opportunity to think, well, if we're going to come and ask you key questions around who you are, what you do, how you measure and view your IR. If there's any other thoughts around the sort of content that you think would be usefully addressed to you and your peers so that we end up across the region with a nice database of information that we can then use again in events like this, but also share with you. And just to say um, a big thank you to Alethea, always behind the scenes, always there, uh, should you have any follow-up questions. She also runs all our publications. She's done an amazing job in the last 12 months in particular, um, but has been doing that for some time. And I'm sure if you have any unanswered questions, given that I never give particularly good answers to any sensible questions, Alethea is your person, and I'm sure she'll point you in the right direction. Just remains for me a bit ahead of time to wish those um, celebrating Ramadan from next week, Ramadan Karim, and to wish you all a, a good day. And we very much look forward to being with you again, ideally in person, because I don't know about you guys, but it's driving me mad uh, being online the whole time. But we've managed and we'll continue to manage until we meet again. Take care and thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.